Hello and welcome to our video summarizing all you need to know about the novel A Passage to India by E.M. Foster. My name is Bani and in this video we will look at A Passage to India, specifically beginning with some context related to the author as well as ideas at the time this novel was written that you will need to be aware of. We will then look into the novel's plot in detail and we will examine the necessary information you will need to understand before looking at each character in the novel in depth, key themes related to this novel, as well as important symbols. This video is really useful, especially if you are studying a passage to India as part of your English coursework or exams, as we will go into the details you will need to know to get top marks. So let's get started. Overview a Passage to India, published in 1924, is a novel by English author A.M. Foster, set against the backdrop of the British Raj and the Indian independence movement in the 1920s. It was selected as one of the 100 great works of the 20th century English literature by the Modern Library, and won the 1924 James Tate Black Memorial Prize for Fiction. Time magazine included the novel in its all-time 100 novels list. The novel is based on Foster's experiences in India, deriving the title from Walt Whitman's 1870 poem, Passage to India in Leaves of Grass. Context The story revolves around four characters, Dr. Aziz, his British friend Mr. Cyril Fielding, Mrs. Moo and Miss Adela Quested. During a trip to the fictitious Marabar Caves, modelled on the Barabar Caves of Bihar, Adela thinks she finds herself alone with Dr. Aziz in one of the caves, when in fact he is in an entirely different cave, and subsequently panics and flees. It is assumed that Dr. Aziz has attempted to assault her. Aziz's trial and its run-up and aftermath bring to boil the common racial tensions and prejudices between Indians and the British who ruled India. The Indian self-rule movement was a mass-based movement that encompassed various sections of society. It also went a process of constant ideological evolution. Although the basic ideology of the movement was anti-colonial, it was supported by a vision of independent capitalist economic development, coupled with a secular, democratic, republican and civil libertarian political structure. After the 1930s, the movement took on a strong socialist orientation. The work of these various movements led ultimately to the Indian Independence Act 1947, which ended the suzerainty in India and the creation of Pakistan. India remained a dominion of the crown until 26 January 1950, when the constitution of India came into force, establishing the Republic of India. Pakistan was a dominion until 1956, when it adopted its first republican constitution. Long before Foster visited India, he had already gained a vivid picture of its people and places from a young Indian Muslim named Saeed Ross Masood, whom Foster began tutoring in England starting in 1906. Foster and Masood became very close, and Masood introduced Foster to several of his Indian friends. Echoes of the friendship between the two can be seen in the characters of Fielding and Aziz in A Passage to India. By the time Foster first visited India in 1912, the Englishman was well prepared for his travels throughout the country. At the time of Foster's visit, the British government had officially been ruling India since 1858 after the failed Sepoy Rebellion in 1857, in which Indians attempted to regain rule from the British East India Company. The East India Company, a privately owned trading concern, had been gaining financial and political power in India since the 17th century. By the time of Foster's visit, Britain's control over India was complete. English governors headed each province and, was, and were responsible to Parliament. Though England had promised the Indian people a role in government in exchange for their aid during World War I, India did not win independence until three decades later, in 1947. Foster spent time with both Englishmen and Indians during his visit, and he quickly found he preferred the company of the latter. He was troubled by the racial oppression and deep cultural misunderstandings that divided the Indian people and the British colonists, or as they're called in a passage to India, Anglo-Indians. The prevailing attitude among the British in India was that the colonists were assuming the white man's burden. Novelist Rudyard Kipling, 
Kipling's phrase of governing the country because the Indians could not handle the responsibility themselves. Foster, a homosexual living in a society and era largely unsympathetic to his lifestyle, had long experienced prejudice and misunderstanding firsthand. It is no surprise then that Foster felt sympathetic toward the Indian side of the colonial argument. Indeed, Foster became a lifelong advocate for tolerance and understanding among people of different social classes, races and backgrounds. Foster began writing A Passage to India in 1913, just after his first visit to India. The novel was not revised and completed, however, well until after his second stay in India, in 1921, when he served as secretary to the Maharaja of Deva's state senior. Published in 1924, A Passage to India examines the racial misunderstandings and cultural hypocrisies that characterize the complex interactions between Indians and the English toward the end of the British occupation of India. Moving on to the plot summary. Two English women, the young Miss Adela Quested and the elderly Mrs. Moore, travel to India. Adela expects to become engaged to Mrs. Moore's son, Ronnie, a British magistrate in the Indian city of Chandrapur. Adela and Mrs. Moore each hope to see the real India during their visit, rather than cultural institutions imported by the British. At the same time, Aziz, a young Muslim doctor in India, is increasingly frustrated by the poor treatment he receives at the hands of the English. Aziz is especially annoyed with Major Calendar, the civil surgeon, who has a tendency to summon Aziz for frivolous reasons in the middle of dinner. Aziz and two of his educated friends, Hamidullah and Mahmood Ali, hold a lively conversation about whether or not an Indian can be friends with an Englishman in India. That night, Mrs. Moore and Aziz happen to run into each other while exploring a local mosque, and the two become friendly. Aziz is moved and surprised that an English person would treat him like a friend. Mr. Toton, the collector who governs Chandrapur, hosts a party so that Adela and Mrs. Moore may have the opportunity to meet some of the more prominent and wealthy Indians in the city. At the event, which proves to be rather awkward, Adela meets Cyril Fielding, the principal of the government college in Chandrapur. Fielding, impressed with Adela's open friendliness to the Indians, invites her and Mrs. Moore to tea with him and the Hindu professor Godbule. At Adela's request, Fielding invites Aziz to tea as well. At the tea, Aziz and Fielding immediately become friendly and the afternoon is overwhelmingly pleasant until Ronnie heals up, arrives and rudely interrupts the party. Later that evening, Adela tells Ronnie that she has decided not to marry him. But that night, the two are in a car accident and the excitement of the event causes Adela to change her mind about the marriage. Not long afterward, Aziz organizes an expedition to the nearby Malabar, Marabar caves for those who attended Fielding's tea. Fielding and Professor Korpule miss the tree train to, the, to Marabar, so Aziz continues on alone with the two ladies, Adela and Mrs. Moore. Inside one of the caves, Mrs. Moore is unnerved by the enclosed space, which is crowded with Aziz's retinue, and by the uncanny echo that seems to translate every sound she makes into the noise, boom. Aziz, Adela and a guide go on to the higher caves while Mrs. Moore waits below. Adela, suddenly realising that she does not love Ronnie, asks Aziz whether he has more than one wife, a question he considers offensive. Aziz storms off into a cave and when he returns, Adela is gone. Aziz calls the guide for losing Adela and the guide runs away. Aziz finds Adela's broken field glasses and heads down the hill. Back at the picnic site, Aziz finds Fielding waiting for him. Aziz is unconcerned to learn that Adela has hastily taken a car back to Chandrapur, as he is overjoyed to see Fielding. Back in Chandrapur, however, Aziz is unexpectedly arrested. He is charged with attempting to rape Adela Custard while she was in the caves, a charge based on a claim Adela herself made. Fielding, believing Aziz to be innocent, angers all of British India by joining the Indians in Aziz's defence. In the weeks before the trial, the racial tensions between the Indians and the English fare up considerably. Mrs. Moore is distracted and miserable because of her memory of the echo in the cave and because of her impatience with the upcoming trial. Adela is emotional and ill. She too seems to suffer from an echo in her mind. Ronnie is fed up with Mrs. Moore's lack of support for Adela and it is agreed that Mrs. Moore will return to England earlier than planned. Mrs. Moore dies on the voyage back to England, but not before she realises that there is no real India, but rather a complex multitude of different Indias. 
At Aziz's trial, Adela under oath is questioned about what happened in the caves. Shockingly, she declares that she made a mistake. Aziz is not the person that attacked her in the cave. Aziz is set free and Fielding escorts Adela to the government college, where she spends the next several weeks. Fielding begins to respect Adela, recognizing a baby in standing against her peers to pronounce Aziz innocent. Ronnie breaks off his engagement to Adela and she returns to England. Aziz, however, is angry that Fielding would befriend Adela after she nearly ruined Aziz's life, and the friendship between the two men suffers as a consequence. Then Fielding sails off for a visit to England. Aziz declares that he is done with the English and that he intends to move to a place where he will not have to encounter them. Two years later, Aziz has become the chief doctor to the Raja of Mao, a Hindi region several hundred miles away from Chandrapur. He has heard that Fielding married Adela shortly after returning to England. Aziz now virulently hates all the English people. One day, walking through an old temple with his three children, he encounters Fielding and his brother-in-law. Aziz is surprised to learn that the brother-in-law's name is Ralph Moore. It turns out that Fielding married not Adela Quested, but Stella Moore, Mrs. Moore's daughter from a second marriage. Aziz befriends Ralph. After he accidentally runs his rowboat into Fielding's, Aziz renews his friendship with Fielding as well. The two men go for a final ride together before Fielding leaves, during which Aziz tells Fielding that once the English are out of India, the two will be able to be friends. Fielding asks why they cannot be friends now, when they both want to be, but the sky and the earth seem to say, no, not yet, no, not there. Moving on to a detailed summary of each chapter. Part 1 Chapter 1 Chandrapur is an undistinguished Indian town except for the outlying Marabar caves. The small, dirty city sits next to the river Ganges. Slightly inland from the city near the railway station lie the plain, sensible buildings of the British colonials. From the vantage point of these buildings, Chandrapur appears lovely because its unattractive parts are obscured by tropical vegetation. Newcomers, in order to lose their romantic image of the city, must be driven down to the city itself. The language that Foster uses to describe the town creates the feeling of monotony, vast space and infinity. The separation of the English settlement from the Indian is as distinct in the character and attitudes of the people as it is in the physical appearance of the houses and grounds. The British buildings and the rest of Chandrapur are connected only by the Indian sky. The sky dominates the whole landscape. Chapter 2 Dr. Aziz, an Indian Muslim, arrives late to his friend Hamidullah's house, where Hamidullah and Mahmood Ali are engaged in a debate over whether it is possible for an Indian and an Englishman to be friends. Hamidullah, who studied at Cambridge when he was young, contends that such a cross-cultural friendship is possible in England. The men agree that Englishmen in India are have all become insufferable within two years and all English women within six months. Aziz prefers to happily ignore the English. Hamidullah takes Aziz behind the partha, the screen that separates women from public interaction, to chat with his wife. Hamidullah's wife scolds Aziz for not having remarried after the death of his wife. Aziz, however, is happy with his life and sees his three children at his mother-in-law's house often. The men sit down to dinner along with Muhammad Latif, a poor, lazy relative of Hamidullah. Aziz recites poetry for the men and they listen happily, feeling momentarily that India is one. Poetry in India is a public event. During dinner, Aziz receives a summon from his superior, Major Calendar, the civil surgeon. Annoyed, Aziz bicycles away to Calendar's bungalow. When Aziz's bicycle tire deflates, he hires a tonga, a small pony-drawn vehicle, and finally arrives at Calendar's house to find that the major has gone and left no message. Furthermore, as Aziz is speaking with a servant on the porch, Mrs. Calendar and her friend, Mrs. Leslie, rudely take Aziz's hired tonga for their own use. Aziz decides to walk home. On the way, he stops at his favourite mosque. To Aziz, the mosque, with its beautiful architecture, is a symbol of the truth of Islam and love. Aziz imagines building his own mosque with an inscription for his tomb addressing, quote, those who have secretly understood my heart, unquote. 
Aziz suddenly notices an English woman in the mosque and yells at her angrily, for she is trespassing in a holy place for Muslims. The woman is humble, however, and explains that she has removed her shoes upon entering and that she realizes that God is present in the mosque. Aziz is impressed. The woman introduces herself as Mrs. Moore. She is visiting her son, Ronnie Heelstop, the city magistrate. Aziz and Mrs. Moore discover that they each have two sons and a daughter. Aziz senses Mrs. Moore's friendly sympathy toward him, a sense confirmed when Mrs. Moore speaks candidly of a distaste for Mrs. Callender, the major's wife. Because Mrs. Moore is intuitively able to sense whom she likes and does not like, Aziz pronounces her an oriental. Aziz escorts her to the door of the White's only club. Chapter 3 Inside the club, Mrs. Moore joins a travelling companion, a young English woman named Adela Quested. They sit in the billiard room in order to avoid the performance of the play Cousin Kate that is taking place in the next room. Mrs. Moore has escorted Adela from England at Ronnie's request. Adela and Ronnie are presumably to become engaged. Mr. Torton, the collector of Chandrapur, enters and speaks highly of Ronnie as the type of young man he likes. The play lets out and the billiard room begins to fill. Adela expresses a desire to see the real India. She wants something more than the stereotypical elephant ride most visitors get. Cyril Fielding, the principal of the local government college, passes through the room and suggests that Adela go see some Indians if she wants to see the real India. The club ladies, however, are aghast at such a suggestion and they inform Adela that Indians are creepy and untrustworthy. Nonetheless, Mr. Torton, eager to please Adela, promises to round up some Indians for a bridge party so Della can meet some of them. On the way home, Mrs. Moore po points out the mosque to Ronnie and Adela and speaks of the nice young man she met there. Ronnie assumes from Mrs. Moore's tone that she is referring to an Englishman and he becomes angry when he realises she is speaking of an Indian. Back at the bungalow, after Adela goes to bed, Ronnie quizzes his mother about her encounter. Using phrases he has picked up from his superiors, Ronnie interpre interprets each detail of Mrs. Moore's encounter as scheming on Aziz's part. Ronnie declares his intention to report Aziz to Major Callender, but Mrs. Moore dissuades him. In turn, Ronnie convinces his mother not to tell Adela about Dr. Aziz. Ronnie worries that Adela will become too preoccupied with whether or not the English treat the Indians fairly. They finish talking and Mrs. Moore goes to be her bed. She notices a small wasp asleep in her on her coat hook and croons to it kindly. Chapter 4 Mr. Toton invites several Indian gentlemen to the proposed bridge party at the club. The Indians are surprised by the invitation. Mahmood Ali suspects that the Lieutenant General has ordered Toton to hold the party. The Nawab Bahadur, one of the most important Indian landowners in the area, announces that he appreciates the invitation and will attend. Some accuse the Nawab Bahadur of cheapening himself, but most Indians highly respect him and decide to attend as well. The narrator describes the room in which the gentlemen meet. Outside remain the Lolia Indians, who receive no invitation. The narrator describes Mr. Greyfoot and Mr. Soli, missionaries on the outskirts of the city. Mr. Soli feels that all men go to heaven, but, now, but not lowly wasps, bacteria or mud, because something must be excluded to leave enough for those who are included. Mr. Soli's Hindu friends disagree, however, as they feel that God includes every living being. Chapter 5. At the bridge party, the Indian guests stand idly at one side of the tennis lawn while the English stand at the other. The clear segregation dismays the Delacrested and Mrs. Moore. Ronnie and Mrs. Totten disdainfully discuss the Indian's clothing, which mixes Eastern and Western styles. Several English women arrive and discuss the earlier production of Cousin Kate. Mrs. Moore is surprised to note how intolerant and conventional Ronnie's opinions have become. Mr. Turton arrives, cynically noting to himself that each guest has come for a self-serving reason. Reluctantly, Mrs. Turton takes Adela and Mrs. Moore to visit a group of Indian ladies. Mrs. Turton addresses the Indian women in crude Urdu and then asks Mrs. Moore and Adela if they are satisfied. One of the Indian women speaks and Mrs. Turton is surprised to learn that the women know English. Mrs. Moore and Adela unsuccessfully try to draw the Indian women out into more substantial conversation. Mrs. Moore asks one of them, Mrs. Bhattacharya, if she and Adela can visit her home. Mrs. Bhattacharya agrees to host the English women, women the upcoming Thursday. 
and her husband promises to send his carriage for them. Mr. Fielding, who is also at the party, socializes freely with the Indians and even eats on the Indian side of the lawn. He is pleased to learn that Adela and Mrs. Moore have been friendly to the Indians. Fielding locates Adela and invites her and Mrs. Moore to tea. Adela complains about how rude the English are acting toward their guests, but Fielding sus suspects her complaints are intellectual, not emotional. Adela mentions Dr. Aziz and Fielding promises to invite the doctor to tea as well. That evening, Adela and Ronnie dine with the McBrides and Miss Derrick. The dinner consists of standard English fare. During the meal, Adela begins to dread the prospect of a drab married life among the insensitive English. She fears she will never get to know the true spirit of India. After Adela goes to bed, Ronnie asks his mother about Adela. Mrs. Moore explains that Adela feels that the English are unpleasant to the Indians. Ronnie is dismissive, explaining that the English are in India to keep the peace, not to be pleasant. Mrs. Moore disagrees, saying it is the duty of the English to be pleasant to Indians, as God demands love for all men. Mrs. Moore instantly regrets mentioning God. Ever since she has arrived in India, her God has seemed less powerful than ever before. Chapter 6 The morning after Aziz's encounter with Mrs. Moore, Major Calendar scolds the doctor for failing to report promptly to his summons, and he does not ask for Aziz's side of the story. Aziz and a colleague, Dr. Panna Lal, decide to attend the bridge party together. However, the party falls on the anniversary of Aziz's wife's death, so he decides not to attend. Aziz mourns his loving wife for part of the day and then borrows Hamidullah's pony to practice polo on the town green. An English soldier is also practicing polo and he and Aziz pray together briefly as comrades. Dr. Lal, returning from the bridge party, runs into Aziz. Lal reports that Aziz's absence was noticed and he insists on knowing why Aziz did not attend. Aziz, consider, considering Lal ill-mannered to ask such a question, reacts defiantly. By the time Aziz reaches home, though he has begun to worry that the English will punish him for not attending, his mood improves when he opens Fielding's invitation to tea. Aziz is pleased that Fielding has politely ignored the fact that Aziz forgot to respond to an invitation to tea at Fielding's last month. Chapter 7 Fielding's many worldly experiences keep him from being insensitive toward Indians like the rest of the English. The English mildly distrust Fielding, partly out of suspicion of his efforts to educate Indians as individuals. Fielding also makes offhand comments that distrust, distress the English, such as his remark that whites are actually pink or grey. Still, Fielding manages to remain friendly with the men at the English club while also socialising with Indians. Aziz arrives at Fielding's for tea as Fielding is dressing. Though the two men have never met, they treat each other informally, which delights Aziz. Fielding breaks the collar stud for his shirt, but Aziz quickly removes his own and gives it to Fielding. The relations between the two men sour only briefly when Aziz misinterprets Fielding's dismissive comment about a new school of painting to be dismissive of Aziz himself. Aziz is disappointed when Mrs. Moore and Adela arrive as their presence upsets the intimacy of his conversation with Fielding. The party continues to be informal, though even though with the women present. Aziz feels comfortable addressing the women as he would address men, as Mrs. Moore is so elderly and Adela so plain-looking. The ladies are disappointed and confused because the Bhattacharyas never sent their carriage this morning as promised. Adela pronounces it a mystery, but Mrs. Moore disagrees. Mysteries she likes, but this is a model. Feeling pronounces all India a model, as Aziz denounces the rudeness of the Hindu Bhattacharyas and invites the women to his own house. To Aziz's horror, Adela takes his invitation, literally, and, tasks, and asks for his address. Aziz is ashamed of his shabby residence and distracts Adela with commentary on Indian architecture. Fielding knows that Aziz has some historical facts wrong, but Fielding does not correct Aziz as other Englishmen would have. At the moment, Fielding recognises truth of mood over fact. The last of Fielding's guests, the Hindu professor, Godbole, arrives. Aziz asks Adela if she plans to settle in India, to which Adela spontaneously responds that she cannot. Adela then realises that in making this admission, she has essentially told strangers that she will not marry Ronnie before she has even told Ronnie so herself. Adela's words fluster Mrs. Moore. Fielding then takes Mrs. Moore on a tour of the college grounds. 
Adela again mentions the prospect of visiting Aziz's house, but Aziz invites her to the Marwar Caves instead. Aziz attempts to dis describe the caves, but it becomes clear that Aziz has never seen them. Godbole has been to the caves, but he does not adequately describe why they are extraordinary. In fact, Aziz senses that Godbole is holding back information. Suddenly, Ronnie arrives to take Adela and his mother to a polo match at the club. Ronnie ignores the Indians. Aziz becomes excitable and overly intimate in reaction to Ronnie's rude interruption. Feeling reappears and Ronnie privately holds him, scolds him for leaving Adela alone with Indians. Before the ladies leave, Godbole sings an odd-sounding Hindu song in which the singer asks God to come to her, but God refuses. In her ignorance, Adela regarded Aziz as India and never surmised that his outlook was limited and his method inaccurate and that no one is India. Chapter 8 Driving away from Fieldings, Adela expresses annoyance at Ronnie's rudeness. Adela mentions Aziz's invitation to the Marabar Caves, but Ronnie immediately forbids the women to go. Ronnie mentions Aziz's unpinned collar as an example of Indian's general inattention to detail. Mrs. Moore, tired of bickering, asks to be dropped off at home. Adela suddenly feels ashamed of telling those at the party of her intention to leave India. After the polo match, Adela quietly tells Ronnie that she has decided not to marry him. Ronnie is disappointed but agrees to remain friends with her. Adela sees a green bird and asks Ronnie what type of bird it is. Ronnie does not know which confirms Adela's feeling that nothing in India is identifiable. Ronnie and Adela begin to feel lonely and useless in each other's surroundings. They suddenly feel they share more similarities than the differences. The Nawab Bahadur happens by and offers Ronnie and Adela a ride in his automobile. Riding in the back seat, the two feel dwarfed by the dark night and expansive landscapes around them. Their hands accidentally touch and they feel an animalistic thrill. The car mysteriously breaks down on a road outside the city. They all climb out and determine that the car must have hit something, probably a hyena. After a short while, Miss Derek drives past them, offers them a ride back to Chandrapur. Driving back to Chandrapur, Miss Derek jokes about her employer, an Indian noblewoman. Ronnie and Adela feel drawn together by their shared distaste for Miss Derek's crass manner and for the Nawab's polite but long-winded speeches. When Adela and Ronnie arrive back at the bungalow, Adela says that she would like to mar marry Ronnie after all. He agrees. Adela, however, immediately feels a sense of disappointment, believing she will now be labelled the same as all other married English women in India. They go inside and tell Mrs. Moore of their plans. Adela begins to feel more pleasant, joining Ronnie in poking fun at the Nawab Bahadur. When Ronnie and Adela tell Mrs. Moore of the strange car accident, the older woman shivers and claims the car must have hit a ghost. Meanwhile, down in the city of Chandrapur, the Nawab Bahadur describes the accident to others. He explains that it took place near the site where he ran over and killed a drunken man nine years ago. The Nawab Bahadur insists that a dead man caused the accident that occurred this evening. Aziz is sceptical, however, and feels that Indians should not be too superstitious. Chapter 9 Three days after tea party, Aziz falls ill. Exaggerating his illness, he remains in bed and contemplates a brief trip to a brothel in Calcutta to lift his spirits. Aziz takes a rather clinical view of his occasional need for women. Aziz knows that Major Calendar and other women would, others would be scandalized by his plans to visit the brothel. Nonetheless, Aziz does not mind breaking social codes. He simply tries not to get caught. Aziz suddenly notices that flies cover the inside of his room, so he summons his servant, Hassan, to dispose of them. Hassan is inattentive. Hamidullah, Saeed Muhammad, Haq and Saeed Muhammad's young nephew, Rafi, all crowd into Aziz's room to inquire about his health. Rafi gossips that Professor Godbole has also fallen ill. The visitors briefly toss around a suspicion that Mr. Fielding poisoned the men at his tea. Saeed Muhammad and Haq discuss how all disease comes from Hindus. Aziz recites an irrelevant poem by an Urdu poet. Though not all of the men comprehend the poetry, they, they are happily silent and for a moment feel that India is one. Hamidullah silently contemplates the nationalist meeting he must attend later in the day, which will gather Indians from many different sects. Hamidullah sadly considers that the group never achieves anything constructive and that the meetings are only peaceful when someone is denouncing the English. The visitors announce their intent to leave, but they remain seated. Dr. Panna Lal arrives under Major Calendar's orders to check on Aziz. 
Dr. Lal immediately realizes that Aziz is not very ill, but he decides to cover for Aziz anyway, in hopes that Aziz will return the favor one day. After some prodding, Dr. Lal reluctantly reports that Professor Kotbulay's condition is not serious, which prompts the men to scold Rafi for spreading rumors. Dr. Lal's troublesome dri driver, Ramchand, insults Rafi's uncle, Saeed Muhammad, and a loud argument breaks out. At this moment, Fielding walks into the room. Aziz would normally be humiliated at Fielding seeing his poor, dirty room, but Aziz is distracted. Concerned about showing hospitality to Rafi, Aziz murmurs to the boy and tries to make him comfortable again after his scolding. Meanwhile, the men begin to question Fielding about his belief in God, the declining morality of the West and what he thinks about England's position in India. Fielding enjoys being candid with the men. He explains that he is not certain that England is justified in holding India and that he is in India personally to hold a job. The men are shocked by the plainness of Fielding's honesty. Fielding, feeling disappointed by his first visit to Aziz, leads the other men out of Aziz's sick room. Chapter 10 Fielding and the others emerge from Aziz's home and feel oppressed by the weather and the general atmosphere outside. Several animals nearby make noises. The inarticulate animal world seems always more present in India than in England. The other men mount their cages and go home rather than back to work. All over India, people retreat inside as the hot season approaches. Chapter 11. Fielding stands on the porch of Aziz's house, but no servant brings his horse, for Aziz has secretly ordered the servants not to. Aziz calls Fielding back inside. Though Aziz self-pityingly draws Fielding's attention to the shabbiness of his home, Fielding is matter-of-fact in response. Aziz directs Fielding to a photograph that he keeps in a drawer, which is of his late wife. Flattered, Fielding thanks Aziz for the honour of seeing the picture. Aziz tells Fielding he likes him because he values men acting as brothers. They agree that the English government has tried to improve India through institutions when it should have begun with friendship. Fielding suddenly feels depressed, feeling that he cannot match Aziz's fervent emotions. Fielding wishes he had personal details to share with Aziz. He momentarily feels as though he will not be intimate with anyone but will travel through life calm and isolated. Aziz questions Fielding about his family but the Englishman has none. Aziz playfully suggests that Fielding should marry Adela. Fielding replies vehemently that Adela is a prick who tries to learn about India as though it were a class at school. He adds that Adela has become engaged to Ronnie Slop. Aziz is relieved, assuming that this means he will not have to host a trip to the Maravar Caves after all, as it would be unseemly to escort an engaged woman. Aziz agrees with Fielding's distaste of Adela, but Aziz objects to her lack of beauty rather than her attitude. Aziz suddenly feels protective of Fielding and warns him to be less frank with other Indians. Aziz worries that Fielding might lose his job, but the Englishman reassures him that it wouldn't matter. Fielding explains that he believes in travelling light, which is why he refuses to marry. Fielding leaves and Aziz drifts off to sleep, dreaming happily. Part 2 Chapter 12 The hills containing the Marabar Caves are older than anything else on earth. The rocky hills thrust up up thrust up abruptly from the soils and resemble nothing else in the surrounding landscape. Each cave has a narrow entrance tunnel that leads to a large, dark, circular chamber. If a match is lit inside the caves, its reflection appears clearly in the polished stone of the cave walls. The caves seem to embody nothingness. Their reputation spreads not just by word of mouth, but seemingly through the earth itself or through the animals. On the highest hill of the rock formations precariously rests a large boulder, which is thought to be hollow. The hill is called Kavadol. Chapter 13 Looking toward the Marabar hills one day, Adela remarks that she would have liked to visit them with Aziz. Her servant overhears the remark, an exaggerated word of it travels to Aziz, who feels that he must make good on his earlier offer. The outing involves many details and much expense on Aziz's part, but he organizes everything and invites Fielding and Gorpole, along with the two ladies, to Mar Marabar. Ronnie gives permission for the women to go, as long as Fielding goes along with them. The train that travels to the hills leaves just before dawn, so Aziz, Muhammad, Latif and many servants spend the night at the train station to avoid being late. Mrs. Moore, Adela and the women's servant, Antony, arrive early in the morning. Adela dislikes Antony and, on Aziz's suggestion, orders him to go home. Antony refuses. However, on Ronnie's orders, 
until Muhammad Latif bribes him to leave. Chapter 13 Through, Though Fielding has not yet arrived with God Bulay, Aziz is not nervous because he knows that Englishmen never miss trains. Aziz refused, reviews the details of the trip with Muhammad Latif, who is to oversee the railway carriage. Suddenly, the train starts to move just as Fielding and God Bulay arrive at the station. Fielding yells that God Bulay's overlong prayers have made them late, and the Englishman tries unsuccessfully to jump on the train. Aziz panics and desperate and is desperate, but Mrs. Moore and Adela reassure him that the outing will continue successfully without fielding. Aziz suddenly feels love for the two women, Mrs. Moore especially for their graciousness and kindness to race. Chapter 14 Ever since they heard God Bully sing his Hindu song at Fielding's tea, Adela and Mrs. Moore have lived as though inside cocoons, not feeling anything. Mrs. Moore accepts her apathy, but Adela blames herself for her feelings of indifference. Adela even fakes ex excitement at times because she feels like she should be excited. During the train ride, Adela thinks and chats with Mrs. Moore about her future plans. The elder Englishwoman, who is not in good, good health, feels impatient with marriage. She thinks to herself that society's valuation of marriage over other relationships has stunted its understanding of human nature. Nearing the hills, the train comes to a stop next to an elephant. For Aziz's benefit, Adela and Mrs. Moore feign excitement about taking an elephant ride. Aziz feels happy and relieved as he indeed went to great trouble to obtain the elephant. The group climbs up onto the elephant and many villagers gather and walk with it to the Marabar Caves. In the pale early morning, morning light, the landscape appears colourless and somewhat lifeless, suffused with an odd silence. Illusions abound, but there is no romance. Adela mistakes a tree branch for a snake. The villagers concur that it is a snake and refuse to let Adela correct their error. The group finally reaches the hills, but Adela and Mrs. Moore do not find them beautiful, and Aziz does not know enough about the area to act as an effective tour guide. While Aziz's servants prepare tea for the women, he reflects happily that the trip is success thus far. He likens himself to the Mughal Emperor Babur, who never stopped showing hospitality and never betrayed a friend. The women ask Aziz about Babur and about another Mughal Emperor, Akbar. Aziz is only contempt for Akbar, who foolishly thought that he could use religion to unite all of India, when nothing can accomplish that goal. Adela expresses her hope that there will be something universal in India, if only to keep her from becoming snobby and rude like the other English women. The group enters the first cave, which becomes crowded when the villagers follow them. Mrs. Moore feels crowded, and she panics when something strikes her on her face. She is terrified by the cave's echo, which takes all the sounds and reduces them to the sound boom. The group exits the cave, and Mrs. Moore realizes that she was it was only a baby that hit her face. She politely refuses to enter another cave, but she encourages Adela to continue on with Aziz. At Mrs. Moore's suggestion, Aziz forbids the villagers to accompany them into the next set of caves. Aziz, Adela and the guide leave. Mrs. Moore tries to write a letter to her other children, Stella and Ralph, but she is haunted by the sound of the echo in the cave. The echo seems to suggest that nothing has value and it renders even the words of Mrs. Moore's Christianity null. Mrs. Moore becomes despairing and completely apathetic. Chapter 15 Aziz, Adela and the guide climb up together other caves higher in the hills. Aziz's mind is preoccupied with breakfast preparations. Adela is also distracted as she suddenly realizes that she and Ronnie are not in love. Adela asks Aziz if he is married and if he has more than one wife. The second question shocks Aziz and he ducks into a cave to recover. Adela follows shortly and enters another cave. Chapter 16 Aziz exits the cave to find the guide alone. The two men hear the sound of a motor car. Aziz looks for Adela and the guide explains that she went into one of the caves. Aziz calls the guide for not keeping Adela in sight and together they shout for her. In frustration, Aziz slaps the guide who runs away. Then with relief, Aziz notices Adela already down the hills, speaking to a woman near the motor car. Aziz notices Adela's field glasses lying broken on the ground. He picks them up and proceeds back to the camp, where he is elated to find that Fielding has arrived in Miss Derrick's car. 
Aziz sends a retinue down to escort Miss Derek up to the camp, but Miss Derek and Adela have already started to drive back to Chandrapur. Aziz cheerfully accepts this new development, but Fielding senses that something is wrong with Adela. Aziz, wanting to avoid the unpleasant memory of Adela's question about polygamy, has already refined the facts of their excursion up the hill. Fielding presses Aziz for details because he feels the two women have been rude to the Indian. Aziz, barely realizing he's lying, reassures Fielding that the guide escorted Adela down to the car. On the elephant ride back to the train, Fielding figures that the expedition must have cost Aziz hundreds of rupees. The group boards the train and rides back to Chandrapur. When they arrive at the city, Mr. Huck, the inspector of police, boards the train and arrests Aziz. Aziz panics and attempts to run out another door, but Fielding stops him. Fielding calms Aziz, reassuring him that there must be some confusion and that they will stay, straighten it out together. The two men walk out onto the platform where Mr. Totten orders Fielding to remain behind while Aziz goes to prison. Chapter 17 Mr. Totten, looking fanatical and brave, informs Fielding that Adela has been insulted presumably sexually assaulted in one of the Marabar caves. Adela herself has lodged the complaint. Fielding protests that Aziz must be innocent. Toton informs Fielding that there is to be an informal meeting at the club that night to discuss the accusations. Toton explains that Adela is quite ill and he is furious that Fielding is not as enraged as all the other English are. As Toton rides back to his bungalow, he looks with self-satisfied outrage at each Indian he passes. Chapter 18 Mr. McBride, superintendent of police, receives Aziz politely at the jail. McBride has a theory that Indians have criminal tendencies because of the climate. Thus, the Indians' behaviour is not their fault. Fielding arrives at McBride's to get the details of the case. McBride explains that Adela has claimed that Aziz followed her into a cave and made advances on her. She hit at him with the field glasses and he broke the strap. McBride shows Fielding the broken glasses, which the police have found on Aziz's person. Fielding wants to ask Adela if she's completely sure that Aziz attacked her. McBride sends to Major Calendar for permission, but Calendar refuses because Adela is so ill. Mahmood Ali and Hamidullah arrive in turn to consult Aziz. Fielding continues to refuse to believe that Aziz is guilty. McBride begins to tell Fielding of a letter from a brothel owner that has been found in Aziz's house. Fielding doesn't want to hear details, however, and he admits that he himself visited brothels at Aziz's age. A police officer arrives with ev evidence from Aziz's bedroom, including pictures of women. Fielding explains that the photographs are of Aziz's wife. Fielding asks to visit with Aziz. Chapter 19 Fielding runs into Hamidullah outside McBride's office. While Fielding is anxious and impassioned, Hamidullah is calm and resigned. Hamidullah strategizes for Aziz's bail and defense team. Fielding feels deflated by Hamidullah's pragmatism and by the discrepancies in Aziz's story. But Fielding reassures Hamidullah that he is on their side, though he regrets taking sides at all. Fielding returns to the college. Professor Godbully approaches Fielding about several trivial college matters. Fielding asks Godbole if he has heard about Aziz. Godbole has, but he quickly changes the subject. Fielding impatiently asks Godbole if he thinks Aziz is innocent or guilty. Godbole explains that according to his own philosophy, an evil action was performed at the caves, and that action was equally performed by Aziz, the guide, Fielding, Godbole himself, Godbole's students, even Adela herself. This response frustrates Fielding because it does not recognize the difference between good and evil. Godbole clarifies, both good and evil are aspects of God, as God is present in good and absent in evil. Godbole then changes the subject again. Fielding visits Aziz that afternoon, finding the doctor miserable and incoherent. Fielding leaves and writes a letter to Adela. Chapter 20 The English gather at their club. The ladies feel compassion for Adela's suffering and suddenly regret that they were not nicer to her before. As if to make amends, 
Mrs. Stoughton stands by the side of Mrs. Blackiston, a woman she previously snubbed. Mr. Dodden calms the women who fear for their safety. Once the women leave, Dodden speaks to the men. He tries to remain fair, though everyone else overreacts about the possibility that women and children are in danger. One of the men, a drunken soldier, recommends military presence, but Dodden urges everyone to act normally. The soldier fondly mentions an honourable Indian with whom he played polo. Major Callender arrives to report that Adela is recovering. He sits with the soldier and tries to bait fielding. Callender gossips that Adela's servant was bribed to remain outside the caves, that Godbule too was bribed, and that Aziz ordered villagers to suffocate Mrs. Moore. Callender loudly alludes to Fielding's alliance with Aziz, but Fielding refuses to be provoked. Callender suggests that troops be called, but Dodden is against using force. Ronnie arrives and the men stand up and welcome him as a martyr. Fielding, however, remains seated. The drunken soldier calls attention to Fielding's rudeness. Dorton confronts Fielding, who announces that Aziz is innocent. Fielding adds that he will resign from service in India if Aziz is found guilty and that he resigns from the club effective immediately. Dorton becomes furious, but Ronnie tells him to let Fielding go. Chapter 21 Riding into Chandrapur, Fielding passes some children preparing for the celebration of Muharram, an annual Muslim festival honouring the grandsons of the Prophet Muhammad. Fielding meets with Aziz's friends, who have renewed Aziz's bail request and hired a famous anti-British lawyer from Calcutta. Late that night, Fielding has the urge to speak with Godbule, but the professor is asleep. Godbule slips away to a new job a day or two later. Chapter 22 Adela, in shock, remains at McBride's. Miss Derrick and Mr. McBride treat Adela sunburn and pick out the hundreds of cactus spines stuck in her skin from a run down the hill. Adela's emotions swing wildly. She sobs, then tries to logically review what happened. She entered, started the cave echo by scratching the wall with a fingernail, then saw a dark shadow move toward her. She hit at him with her field glasses. He pulled her around the cave, then she escaped. She was never touched. Adela still hears the upsetting echo from the cave. She hopes Mrs. Moore will visit her and make her feel better. When Adela's condition improves, Ronnie retrieves her. McBride and Ronnie inform her that there was a near riot when the procession of the Muharram festival attempted to enter the civil station. They explain to Adela that Das, Ronnie's Indian assistant, will try her case. McBride shows Adela a letter from Fielding, which has been opened. McBride explains that Fielding has betrayed the English. Adela skims the letter and reads the line, Dr. Aziz is innocent. Ronnie takes Adela home. Adela is happy to be reunited with Mrs. Moore, but Mrs. Moore remains on the couch, withdrawn from Adela's advances. Adela tells Mrs. Moore about the echo she's been hearing, and Mrs. Moore responds knowingly. Adela asks Mrs. Moore what it is, but the older woman refuses to put in words, and she predicts morbidly that Adela will hear it forever. Mrs. Moore tells Ronnie she will leave India sooner than she planned. She will not testify at the trial. She will see her other two children into marriage, then retreat from the world. Mrs. Moore is sick of marriage. She sees little difference between love in a church and love in a cave. Mrs. Moore leaves the room. Adela weeps, wondering aloud if she has made a mistake about Aziz. Adela thinks she heard Mrs. Moore say, Dr. Aziz never did it. But Ronnie insists Mrs. Moore never said such words. Ronnie finally convinces Adela that she is remembering lines from Fielding's letter. Ronnie urges her not to wonder aloud if Aziz might be innocent. Mrs. Moore returns and Ronnie asks her to confirm that she never said that Aziz was innocent. Indeed, Mrs. Moore never made such a statement, but she nonetheless responds matter-of-factly that Aziz is innocent. Ronnie asks for evidence. Mrs. Moore replies that Aziz's character is good. Adela wishes she could call off the trial but she realises how inconsiderate that would be 
to the men who have gone to so much trouble for her. Ronnie decides to have his mother leave India as quickly as possible. Chapter 23 The Lieutenant Governor's wife offers to let Mrs. Moore travel back to England in her cabin. As all the other cabins are full, Ronnie is relieved and excited that his name will be made familiar to the Lieutenant Governor. Though Mrs. Moore desi does desire to go home, she feels no joy as she has passed into a state of spiritual apathy. She recognizes that there are eternal forces behind life, but she is indifferent to these forces ever since her experience at the Maraba Caves. To Mrs. Moore, the echo in the caves seemed to be something very selfish, something that predated the world. Since that time, she has felt selfish herself. She even begrudges Adela all of the attention that she has received. Even so, Mrs. Moore's journey to Bombay is pleasant. She watches the sights outside her window and regrets she has not seen all that India has to offer. Bombay seems to mock her for thinking that the Marabar Caves were India, for there are a hundred Indias. Chapter 24 The hot season has begun and everyone retreats indoors, away from the sun. The morning of Aziz's trial, the Totons drive Adela to the courthouse with a police escort. On the way, Mr. Totten thinks to himself that he does not hate Indians, for to do so would be to denounce his own career and the energy spent on them. He concludes that it is English women who really make matters worse in India. In front of the courthouse, students jeer at the car. Rafi, hiding behind a friend, yells that the English are cowards. Inside, the English gather in Ronnie's office and loudly trade rumours about an Indian rebellion and Fielding's traitorous behaviour. Ronnie expresses confidence in his subordinate, Thas, who is acting as judge for the case. Major Callender loudly denounces all Indians. He relates with satisfaction that the Nawab Bahadur's grandson recently suffered severe facial injury from car accident. All Indians should be similarly made to suffer. Everyone ignores Adela, who sits quietly, fearing she will have a breakdown during her examination. When the case is called, the group files into the courtroom to their special chairs. Adela notices the lowly Indian servant operating the fan. He has a beautiful, godlike demeanour and appears aloof from everything taking place in the room. McBride opens the case for the prosecution. He presents a scientific fact, his assertion that darker races lost after fairer races, but not vice versa. An Indian in the audience protests that Adela is ugly. Adela becomes flustered. Calendar requests that Adela be moved to the platform for better air. All of the English then move to the platform. Amrit Rao, the lawyer from Calcutta, protests that having all the English up on the platform will intimidate the witnesses. Das agrees that everyone but Adela must return to the floor. Outside the courtroom, word of this humiliation spreads and the crowd jeers. McBride argues that Aziz lives a double life, simultaneously respectable and depraved. McBride dwells on Aziz's attempt to crush Mrs. Moore in the first cave. Mahmood Ali objects to this accusation, as Mrs. Moore will not be testifying at the trial. Mahmood Ali bemoans the fact that Ronnie has sent Mrs. Moore away, as she knew Aziz was innocent. Despite Thas's attempts to restore calm, Mahmood Ali shouts that the trial is a farce and all of them slaves. He leaves the courtroom in protest. The Indians begin chanting, Mrs. Moore, as if it were a charm, until the chant sounds like, Esmis Ismoor. Adela goes up to the witness stand. She suddenly feels like she is back at Marabar, and that it seems more lovely this time. As McBride questions her, she visualizes each step of that day. When he asks if Aziz followed her into the cave, she requests a minute to answer. Visualizing the caves, she cannot picture him following her. She states quietly that she has made a mistake, that Aziz never followed her. The courtroom erupts. Calendar tries to halt the trial on medical grounds, but Adela confirms that she withdraws all the charges. The enraged Mrs. Totten screams insults at Adela. Thus, officially releases Aziz. Chapter 25 Adela is pushed along in the tide of Indians toward the exit. Fielding asks her where she's going. She responds listlessly 
so he reluctantly takes her to his carriage for her safety. Fielding's students are gathered around the carriage. They convince Fielding and Adela to get inside, and they then pull the two through in town. Indians drape flowers around Adela, though some are critical of the two English sticking together. The roads in Chandrapur are blocked with crowds, and the English are cut off on the way back to the civil station. Adela and Fielding are pulled back to the college. Phone lines are cut and servants gone. Fielding encourages Adela to rest and lies down himself. Meanwhile, Aziz, in his victory procession, cries out for Fielding, who has abandoned him. Mahmood Ali orders a procession to the hospital to rescue the Nawab Bahadur's grandson, and word has circulated that Mahmood Ali overheard Calendar bragging about torturing the young man. The Nawab Bahadur urges restraint, but the crowd proceeds to the hospital. Disaster is averted only by Panna Lal, who mistakenly believes the crowd has come to the hospital to punish him for offering to testify for the English. Lal acts the buffoon to honour the vengeful men, and he retrieves the Nawab Bahadur's grandson for them. The Nawab Bahadur averts further disaster by making a long-winded speech in which he renounces his loyalist title. He invites Aziz and friends to his house for a celebration that night. The baking heat of the hot season bears down on the city, and nearly everyone retreats indoors to sleep. Chapter 26 Feeling reluctant, reluctantly converses with Adela. She wants to discuss her behaviour, but he is unwilling until she mentions that she has been ill. She says that she has been ill with an echo since the day of the trip to the Maravar Caves, or perhaps the day she heard Godbole's song. Feeling admits that he has always suspected she was ill, or perhaps hallucinatory. Adela cannot quite describe the vision she had in court. Nonetheless, Feeling appreciates Adela's meticulous honesty and he apologises for his rudeness to Ronnie. Adela asks Fielding what Az Aziz thinks of her. Fielding uncomfortably thinks about Aziz's contempt for Adela's ugliness. They discuss the possibility that the guide or someone else attacked Adela. Hamidullah arrives and is unhappy to see Fielding and Adela together. Hamidullah expresses severe disapproval of Adela because of the destruction she is carelessly brought upon a seas. Hamidullah invites Fielding to the Nawab Bahadur's house for the victory celebration. Adela prepares to depart, but Fielding invites her to remain at the college while she stays, while he stays with Aziz's friends. Hamidullah, however, is eager to be rid of Adela, for he emotionless for her emotionless demeanor repels him. While the two men discuss what to do with her, Hamidullah is res relieved to notice Ronnie pull up. Fielding meets Ronnie outside and learns that Mrs. Moore has died on the voyage back to England and has been buried at sea. Fielding returns and sends Adela out. He and Hamidullah agree not to tell Aziz about Mrs. Moore until the next day. Adela returns, distraught at Mrs. Moore's death, and asks to remain at the college. At Fielding's request, Adela brings Ronnie inside. Hamidullah is unfriendly to Ronnie. Fielding and Ronnie settle the details of Adela's stay at the college and then Fielding and Hamidullah leave for the Nawab Bahadur celebration. On the way, Fielding overhears Hamidullah saying that Adel Adela should be fined 20,000 rupees. Fielding is distressed that Adela should lose her money and probably her fiancé as well. Chapter 27 Late that night, the celebrants at the victory party are bedded down on the Nawab Bahadur's roof. Fielding and Aziz have a long talk. Aziz anticipates that Fielding will urge him not to make Adela pay any reparations. But Aziz no longer wants the English to admire him for his chivalry. Fielding explains that he himself changed his mind and now believes that Adela acted bravely and will suffer enough as it is. Aziz dismisses Adela because of his lack of beauty. Fielding becomes angry with Aziz's sexual snobbery. Finally, Aziz says he will consult Mrs. Moore and do what she suggests. Fielding points out that Aziz's emotions are disproportionate. It was Adela who saved him, while Mrs. Moore went away. Yet Aziz still loves Mrs. Moore and not Adela. Aziz rejects what he sees as Fielding's materialism, which measures love pound by pound. Fielding explains to Aziz that Mrs. Moore has died, but Hamidullah, overhearing the conversation, tells Aziz that Fielding is joking. Aziz takes it as a joke. 
Chapter 28 In Chandrapur, a legend arises that Rani killed his mother for attempting to save Aziz's life. Two different tombs are reported to contain Mrs. Moore's body, and townspeople leave offerings at both. The English do not respond to the rumours. Rani knows that he was inconsiderate to his mother at the end, but he blames her for the trouble she continues to make with the legend of her death. Rani hopes the troublesome Adela will leave India too. He has not yet broken off their engagement, hoping that she will realise the marriage would ruin his career, and therefore back out politely. Chapter 29 The Lieutenant Governor arrives in Chandrapur to survey the aftermath of the Marabar case. He congratulates Fielding for his upstanding behaviour before and during the trial. Adela continues to stay at the college and she and Fielding talk more frequently. He helps her draft an apology to Aziz. The apology seems unsatisfactory. Though that Adela is just, she does not truly love India and Indians. Aziz and Fielding begin to quarrel about future plans and about Adela's reparation payment. Fielding resorts to a mention of Mrs. Moore and finally, Aziz gives in and agrees to ask Adela only to repay his legal costs. As Aziz has predicted, his generosity wins him, no prestige among the English, who will believe forever that he committed the crime. Ronnie visits Adela at the college and breaks off their engagement. Adela and Fielding talk afterward. Adela sadly repents for the, all, for the trouble she has caused everyone. She admits, though, that she and Ronnie should not have thought about marriage in the first place. Like old friends, Fielding and Adela talk about the difficulties of love. Fielding questions Adela about the incident in the cave one final time. Indifferently, she accepts that it was the guide who assaulted her. She explains that only Mrs. New, Mrs. Moore knew for sure perhaps by telepathy. Fielding and Adela continue to chat, but their practicality and friendliness are slightly plagued by a sense of something indefinable and infinite in the universe. Adela takes a ship home to England. She decides on the way to look up Mrs. Moore's two other children, Ralph and Stella, when she arrives. Chapter 30 One consequence of Aziz's trial is improved relations between Hindus and Muslims in Chandrapur. Mr. Das visits Aziz one day at the hospital and asks Aziz to write a poem for his magazine. The magazine readership is mostly Hindu, but Das hopes to make it appeal to general Indians and believes that Aziz's poem might help. Aziz agrees and goes home to write. All his attempts at poetry are too extreme though. Aziz tries to envision a successful poem for Das, and this speculation leads him to visions of a successful India. Aziz vows to be friendly to Hindus and to hate the British. His character becomes hardened. Aziz meets with Hamidullah one day and explains his plan to take a job in a Hindu state. Hamidullah protests that such a job will not pay enough and scolds Aziz again for not making Adela pay reparations. Then Hamidullah passes on a rumour he has heard that Fielding was having an affair with Adela during a stay at the college. Aziz becomes explosive, yelling that everyone has betrayed him. When Aziz calms down, he and Hamidullah prepare to visit the women of Hamidullah's household in Parda. Hamidullah mentions that the women seemed to be ready to give up Parda at the time of Aziz's trial, but that they have no, not yet done so. Hamidullah suggests that Aziz take a realistic view of the Indian lady as a subject for a poem. Chapter 31 Aziz muses on the rumour of Adela and Fielding for several days, eventually believing it to be fact. When Fielding returns from a conference, Aziz picks him up and tries to address the rumour indirectly, mentioning that McBride and Miss Derrick were caught having an affair. Fielding is uninterested in this gossip, however. Finally, Aziz overtly mentions a rumour about Adela and Fielding, expressing fear that the affair will hurt Fielding's reputation. Aziz clearly is fishing for a straightforward denial, but Fielding does not provide one. Instead, Fielding shides Aziz for worrying too much about reputation and propriety. Aziz finally takes it for granted that Fielding and Adela were having an affair, and he states this directly. Fielding, startled, blows up at Aziz. Aziz is immediately pained at his own mistake and Fielding's harsh words. Aziz agrees, reluctantly, to have dinner with Fielding that night. 
Feeling runs into Toton at the post office. Toton demands Feeling's presence at the Englishman's club at six that evening. Feeling stops by the club briefly to find that many new officials have replaced the old ones, but the tenor feels the same. Feeling likens this repetitive bigotry to an evil echo. At dinner, Feeling tells Aziz that he is travelling to England briefly on official business. Aziz changes the subject to poetry. Feeling expresses hope that Aziz will be a religious poet, because though Feeling is an atheist, he thinks there is something important in religion that has not yet been celebrated, perhaps something in Hinduism. Aziz asks if Feeling will visit Adela in England. Feeling indifferently says that he probably will. At this, Aziz rises to leave. Feeling asks forgiveness for his harshness that morning, but Aziz rides away, feeling depressed. He suspects that Feeling is going to England to marry Adela for her money. Aziz decides to travel with his children tomorrow so that, so that Feeling will be gone for England by the time he returns. Chapter 32 Feeling's ship journey up to the Mediterranean and then docks at Venice. With a feeling of disloyalty, Feeling rediscovers his appreciation for form in architecture. Unlike the random temples and lumpy hills of India, the Venetian buildings appear in harmony with the earth. Feeling feels divided from his Indian friends because of their inability to appreciate form that has escaped modern. On arriving in springtime England, Feeling feels a romantic sense reawakening in him. Part 3 Chapter 33 Two years later and hundreds of miles west of Chandrapur, Aziz lives and works as a physician to the Raja in the Indian-ruled Hindu city of Mal. Professor Godbole also works there as Minister of Education. That night at the Royal Palace, the Hindus of Mao celebrate the midnight births of the god Krishna. Professor Godbole leads a small choir sing in singing hymns. On the wall, one of the many multilingual signs proclaims, God see love, rather than God is love. The crowd is large but calm. Confusion abounds, but the celebrants wear expressions of joy that make them all seem alike. The singers seem to become one with the universe and to love all men. Godbole straightens his princeness and thinks momentarily of Mrs. Moore, and then of a wasp he once saw sitting on a stone. Godbole tries to incorporate the stone along with Mrs. Moore and the wasp into his vision of the oneness of the universe but his conscious effort fails. As midnight approaches, Gorbole and the rest of the crowd begin to dance and chant. The aging and the sick Raja, the ruler of the state, arrives to witness the birth ceremony. At midnight, the crowd heralds the birth of Krishna, the embodiment of infinite love. After overseeing the birth with tears of joy, the Raja is taken away to see Aziz, who tends to him. The crowd continues to celebrate for Krishna's benefit with practical jokes, confused frolic, and playful games. Chapter 34 On the way to his house, Aziz runs into Godbule on the street. Godbule, still in religious ecstasy, manages to tell Aziz that Fielding has arrived at the European guest house. Fielding has come to Mao on official business to check on education. Aziz reflects happily on Godbule, who got Aziz his position at Mao. Aziz is pleased with Mao, where rivalries exist only between Hindu Brahmins and non-Brahmins, not Muslims or Englishmen. Though Aziz is a Muslim himself, the Hindu people of the city accept him because he is respectful. Aziz does not want to see Fielding. He ceases to communicate with him after reading half of a letter from Fielding in England that seemed to say Fielding had married Adela Quested. Aziz finally feels like a true Indian through his hatred of the English and he is happy with his wife away from English-ruled India. His children live with him and he writes poetry. Aziz's poetry addresses the need to abolish the Parada and to create a new motherland. His life is only mildly disrupted by the local English political agent, Colonel Mags, who has orders to watch Aziz as a suspected criminal. Arriving home, Aziz finds a formal note from Fielding forwarded from Godbole, announcing the arrival of himself, his wife and his brother-in-law. The note, like all notes from visiting Englishmen, asks for specific amenities and advice. Aziz tears up the note. 
Chapter 35 In Aziz's garden lies part of a shrine in honour of a young Muslim saint who once freed all the prisoners in the local fort before the police beheaded him. Aziz has come to associate the saint with his own time in prison and to appreciate the shrine. The morning after receiving Fielding's note, Aziz walks with his children to the other section of the shrine, which lies a short distance from their house. Aziz and the children wander through the small shrine and adjoining mosque and then admire the view from the old fort. It is the rainy season and the water tanks are full, promising a good crop to come. A line of prisoners walks nearby. The children ask the prisoners which of them will be freed that night during the traditional Hindu procession of the chief god. The chief god moves through town, stops at the jail and pardons one prisoner. The low caste prisoners politely discuss the matter with Aziz's family. The prison guard asks Aziz about the Raja's health. Aziz says that the Raja's condition has been improving, though in reality the Raja died the night before. Aziz is to keep the Raja's death a secret until the festivities end. Aziz's children notice that Fielding and his brother-in-law are climbing up the ridge to the shrine. The two men enter the shrine, but a swarm of bees chases them out. Fielding's brother-in-law is stung and Aziz walks over to attend to the wound. Fielding, in an unfriendly tone of voice, asks Aziz why he never responded to any of his letters. Suddenly, heavy rain begins to fall and they hurry down to the road to Fielding's carriage. Aziz helps the others into the carriage, referring to Fielding's brother-in-law as Mr. Quested. Fielding is shocked for he married Mrs. Moore's daughter, Stella, not Adela Quested. Thus, the brother-in-law is Mr. Moore. Aziz is suddenly embarrassed and elated Fielding realises the mistake that has caused Aziz's unfriendliness. With little sympathy, Fielding blames the mix-up on Mahmood Ali, who knew that Fielding married Stella. Fielding explains that Mahmood Ali even referred to her as Hezlop's sister in a letter. The name Hezlop infuriates Aziz, who is already angry at the realisation of his mistake. Aziz asks Fielding not to visit him while in Mao. Aziz explains that he still feels almost as betrayed as if Fielding had actually married his enemy and taken what should have been his reparation money. On the other hand, Aziz forgives Mahmood Ali all things because Mahmood Ali loved him. Aziz gathers his children around him and states in Urdu that he wishes no Englishman or Englishwoman to be his friend. Aziz returns home feeling excited. Chapter 36 at sundown that day, Aziz remembers that he promised to send ointment over to the guest house to treat Fielding's brother-in-law's bee stings. Aziz procures some of Muhammad Latif's ointment and decides to take it over himself as an excuse for a ride. Outside, the procession of the god is about to begin. The two claimants to the Raja's throne, sensing that the Raja might be dead, have arrived at the palace. But they make no moves toward the throne while the festival continues. Aziz runs into Godbuli on the street and tells the professor the news about Fielding's wife. Godbule, however, has known all along that Fielding married Stella Moore, not Adela Quested. Aziz refrains from getting angry with Godbule out of respect for the festival time. Riding toward the guest house, Aziz becomes cynical when he notices the English visitors in the guest house boat watching the Hindu festival from afar. Aziz resents this sightseeing, which he views as really a form of ruling or patrolling India. Aziz rides onto the guest house, which is guarded only by a sleeping sentry. He lets himself in and snoops around the rooms, finally finding and reading a letter from Heslop to Fielding and a letter from Adela to Stella. Aziz resents the intimate tone of the letters. Frustrated, Aziz strikes the piano in front of him. Hearing the noise, Ralph Moore comes in, startled. Aziz recovers from his surprise and briskly asks to see the Englishman's bee stings. Ralph retreats from Aziz, saying that Aziz's hands are unkind. Ralph asks why Aziz is treating him and the other English visitors so cruelly. Aziz mentions Adela, but the procession outside nears the jail, and an outburst of sorrow from the crowd distracts them both. Aziz decides to leave and shakes Ralph's hands absentmindedly. Aziz suddenly senses that Ralph is no longer afraid of him. Aziz asks Ralph if he can always tell when a stranger is his friend. Ralph says yes, he can. 
Aziz pronounces Ralph an Oriental, then shivers, remembering that he once said those exact words to Mrs. Moore in the mosque. Aziz is wary that a cycle is beginning again, the friendship of the mosque followed by the horror of the caves. Aziz impulsively offers to take Ralph out on the water for a few minutes. Once on the water, Aziz's old, old hospitality returns and he begins to speak colourfully about the Hindu celebration. Ralph points out what looks like the Raja floating on the water. Aziz admits that he does not know what it is, though he suspects it is the image of the old Raja, which can be seen from only one point on the water. Aziz suddenly feels more like the visitor than the guide. Ralph asks Aziz to row to a vantage point closer to the procession of the god, in which rockets and guns are being shot off. Aziz is afraid of disturbing the celebration and indeed Old Bully catches sight of them and begins to wave his arms wildly. Suddenly, Aziz's boat collides with Fielding's boat. Stella throws herself through toward Fielding and then forward toward Aziz. All four of them fall into the warm, shallow water, just as the Hindu festival in the water nearby reaches its climax. Their bodies, the props of the Hindu ceremony, Ronnie's and Adela's letters and the oar, oars all swirl together. Chapter 37 After the boating accident, Aziz and Fielding suddenly revert to their old friendship. They go for a ride in the jungles around Mao before Fielding's departure. They know they will never see each other again. During the ride, Aziz gives Fielding a letter for Adela, thanking her for her brave action at the trial. Fielding questions Aziz about Hinduism, reluctantly admitting that Stella and Ralph appear strangely drawn to the religion and to Mao. Aziz, impatient with talk of Hinduism, changes the subject to politics. Aziz and Fielding differ more politically than ever before, though they speak about their opinions with trust. Fielding now believes the empire is necessary and he cares less about how polite it is. Aziz, however, hates the empire. He predicts that India will become its own nation in the next generation, at which time he and Fielding might finally be friends. The two men embrace and Fielding asks why they cannot be friends now, as they both seem to want it. But the land and sky themselves seem to arise between Fielding and Aziz, declaring, No, not yet. Character Analysis Dr. Aziz is a warm-hearted, passionate, excitable person whose quick changes of mood lift him to heights of exuberance and cast him into the depths of despair with an exceedingly short space of time. He is high-spirited, fun-loving and hospitable to an exaggerated degree. When he is found in error, he is tre tremendously sensitive. His feelings are genuine, however, and his loyalty to his friends is unquestioned. His response to Mrs. Moore is one of quick affection that remains constant, even after her death. Although he refuses to read Fielding's letters, his deep sense of betrayal is caused by his great love, which he feels has been offended. Aziz's quick response to Mrs. Moore and Fielding is a part of the secret of the understanding heart, which Foster emphasizes as the key to understanding among men. Aziz's name embodies the beginning and the end of human frailties but he makes no mistake about the people who have the ability to judge on the basis of individual worth. Dr. Aziz is a skilled surgeon and a well-educated, intelligent doctor, but the science of medicine is not a matter of deep concern to him, and he gives it up quite readily to live and practice in a more primitive way in a remote Hindu state. Here he is free to write his poetry, extolling the past glories of Islam and pleading for the freedom of women. His poetry exemplifies his quandary. He is a man at the crossroads. One way leads to Western civilization, which would abolish the Purdha and establish sanitary practices. The other would retain Eastern customs, traditions, and the primitive practices of the medicine man. Like Janus, Aziz has two faces. One faces back toward the India of the past, the other to turns towards the West, the civilizing force of which can help conditions in India. Whoever deals with Aziz can never be sure which face he is presenting. Aziz is partly influenced against Western thought by the high-handed ways of the English, who do not make the Western way of life seem attractive. Mrs. Moore, endowed with an understanding heart, is steeped in Christian tradition. Apparently, it has served her well in England. In India, where the problems are more complex, she finds it inadequate. And although her innate sympathy with many of the tenets of Hinduism is indicated, 
her appreciation of all gods of all of God's creation, for example, that religion is also in, inadequate for her. While Professor Godbole withdraws peacefully into himself from human turmoil, Mrs. Moore's own withdrawal is far from peaceful. Therefore, she may be somewhat disappointing to the reader. She brings to India everything that is needed, kindness and the understanding heart, but she turns morose and peevish. She refuses to become involved in helping Adela or Aziz in their time of need. She has, however, imparted her understanding nature to her younger children and has left an indelible mark upon Aziz. And at the trial, it has a chanted name that helps to clarify Adela's mind. Adela. She is presented as a plain young woman whose best qualities are her innate honesty and a kind of courageous decency. Her approach to life is completely intellectual. She is sensible but not sensitive. She serves as an antithesis to Mrs. Moore, who is ruled by emotional intuition. This difference in personalities affects their understanding of each other and of others. Adela's passionless disposition makes her unfit for marriage and a frank objectivity helps her to realize it. It is this guileless attitude that wins Fielding's grudging admiration. Her response to India is one of reason, but since India, with its highly complex issues, cannot be approached through the intellect alone, Adela can never comprehend it. However, she is appalled at the smug and sm snobbish ways of the British Raj. Cyril Fielding is a man of the world. He has not only associated himself with many people, but he has learned to judge them on the basis of merit alone. He is intellectual, kind and committed to helping anyone in need. The injustice manifested toward Aziz in this novel has nothing to do with colour or creed as far as feeling is concerned. It is rather a matter of the violation of a man's rights. Fielding does not defend Aziz because he is an Indian. He defends him because he is innocent. Fielding is Foster's top man to demonstrate the kind of understanding that the world needs. He is dwarfed, as Foster puts it, only because he is committed to earthbound affairs. At the end of the story, he is shown aligning himself with the English by marrying an English girl. This separates him from Aziz but at the same time, he establishes a direct relationship with Mrs. Moore by marrying her daughter. Although Stella is a shadowy figure, Hinduism impresses her and this awakens an interest in Fielding. He feels that contact with Hinduism has somehow improved his marriage and he admits that perhaps the Hindus have found something. Foster leaves the reader to speculate about what might happen if Fielding should become interested in the spiritual side of life. Adela is said to get the worst of both worlds. Fielding, endowed as he is with natural graces, could very well find the best of both worlds. With the combination of human and spiritual understanding, Fielding would certainly be the man most likely to succeed in promoting world understanding. Ronnie Heaslop is pictured as a rubber-stamped product of the public school crowd for whom Foster had so much contempt. He is a typical follower, influenced by power, prestige and a set of pattern of behaviour. These traits make, him, make it easy for him to be led into the Totten Calendar McBride camp, for they represent to Ronnie the peak of social and political prestige. As a disciple of the public school tradition, Ronnie is the ep epitome of the class-conscious Englishman. He does not do judge on the basis of merit, but rather by position on the social ladder. As a result of his training, he cannot countenance or understand anyone who questions these standards. This is why Adela is unsuitable for him and why he cannot be reached by his mother's arguments. Mr. McBride, the superintendent of police who has his own theory that India's climate makes Indians behave criminally. He is generally more tolerant than most of the English at Chandrapur, but still generally assumes the superiority of the English and isn't much inclined to investigate the case against Aziz, instead assuming there isn't any way that Aziz won't be found guilty. Later, McBride is caught having an affair with Miss Derrick. Professor Godbole, a Brahmin Hindu professor at Fielding's College. Godbole is a mysterious and spiritual, a figure associated with universal oneness. He later experiences religious ecstasy at the Hindu festival in Mao. Moving on to theme analysis. Colonialism. 
On one level, a passage to India is an in-depth discussion of daily life in India under British rule. The British Raj, its colonial empire in India, lasted from 1858 to 1947. The prevailing attitude behind colonialism was that of the white man's burden, in Rudyard Kipling's phrase, that it was the moral duty of the Europeans to civilize other nations. Thus, the British saw their colonial rule over India as being for the Indians' own good. Foster himself was British, but in the novel he is very critical of colonialism. He never goes so far as to advocate outright Indian re rebellion, but he does show how the colonial system is inherently flawed. Foster portrays most of the British men working in India as at least well-meaning, although condescending and unoriginal, but their positions in the colonial system almost always push them towards becoming racist and harmful figures. This is played out most explicitly in Ronnie's character development. The colonizers are by necessity playing the role of the oppressor, regardless of how individually kind they may be. Unity Though the main characters of A Passage to India are generally Christian or Muslim, Hinduism also plays a large thematic role in the novel. The aspect of Hinduism with which Foster is particularly concerned is the religion's ideal of all living things, from the lowliest to the highest, united in love as one. This vision of the universe appears to offer redemption to India through mysticism, as individual differences disappear into a peaceful collectivity that doesn't recognize hierarchies. Individual blame and intrigue is foregone in favor of attention to higher spiritual matters. Professor Godbole, the most visible Hindu in the novel, is Foster's mouthpiece for this idea of the unity of all living things. Godbole alone remains aloof from the drama of the plot, refraining from taking sides by recognizing that all are implicated in the evil of the Marawa case. Mrs. Moore also shows openness to this aspect of Hinduism. Though she is a Christian, her experience of India has made her dissatisfied with what she perceives as the smallness of Christianity. Mrs. Moore appears to feel a great sense of connection with all living creatures, as evidenced by her respect for the wasp in the bedroom. Yet, through Mrs. Moore, Foster also shows that the vision of the oneness of all living things can be terrifying, as we see in Mrs. Moore's experience with the echo that negates everything into a boom in Marabar. Such oneness provides unity but also makes all elements of the universe one and the same. A realization that it is implied ultimately kills Mrs. Moore. Muddle and Mystery Foster takes great care to strike a distinction between the ideas of muddle and mystery in a passage to India. Muddle has connotations of dangerous and disorienting disorder, whereas mystery suggests a mystical, orderly plan by a spiritual force that is greater than man. Fielding, who acts as Foster's primary mouthpiece in the novel, admits that India is a model, while figures such as Mrs. Moore and Godbole view India as a mystery. The model that is India in the novel appears to work from the ground up. The very landscape and the architecture of the countryside is formless, and the natural life of plants and animals defies identification. This muddled quality to the environment is mirrored in the makeup of India's native population, which is mixed into a model of different religious, ethnic, linguistic and regional groups. Though Foster is sympathetic to India and Indians in the novel, his overwhelming depiction of India as a model matches the manner in which many Western writers of his day treated the East in their works. As noted by post-colonial scholar Edward Said, these authors in orientalizing of the East made Western logic and capability appear self-evident, and by extension portrayed the West's domination of the East as reasonable or even necessary. Race and Culture Passage to India is in some ways a sort of ethnography, or an examination of the customs of different cultures. Ronnie is kind-hearted, but his public school mindset and the influence of his English peers compel him to become hardened and unkind to Indians. Overall, the pervading culture of the English in India is, is that one must adopt a racist, patronizing attitude to survive and thrive and that one's very Englishness makes one superior to the Indians. Foster also examines the English tendency to be rational without emotion and what is perceived as the English lack of imagination. On the other hand, 
Fawcett portrays the many religions and cultures of India, which are part of the reason the country remains so internally divided. On an individual level, Aziz is portrayed as an embodiment of cultural norms. Foster portrays the Indians as generally more emotional and imaginative than the English. Moving on to E.M. Foster's biography. Edward Morgan Foster was born in London in 1879, the son of an architect. He attended Tonbridge School, which he hated. He caricatured what he termed public school behaviour in several of his novels. A different atmosphere awaited him at King's College, Cambridge, which he enjoyed thoroughly. After graduation, he began to write short stories. He lived for a time in Italy, the scene of two of his early novels, Where Angels Fear to Tread and A Room with the View. Cambridge is a setting for The Longest Journey, published in 1907. It was in this year that he returned to England and delivered a series of lectures at Working Men's College. His most mature work to date was to appear in 1910 with the publication of Howard's End. Foster then turned to literary journalism and wrote a play which is never staged. In 1911, he went to India with G. Lowe's Dickinson, his mentor at King's College. During World War I, Foster was engaged in civilian war work in Alexandria. He returned to Long London after the war as a journalist. In 1921, he again went to India to work as secretary to the Maharaja of Deva State's senior. He had begun work on a passage to India before this time, but on reading his notes in India, he was discouraged and then put them aside. The book was published in 1924, having been written upon his return to England. In 1927, Foster delivered the William George Clark Lectures at Trinity College, Cambridge. Titled Aspects of the Novel, the lectures were published in book form the same year. Also in 1927, he became a Fellow of Cambridge University. Foster's writing after that time have been varied. A collection of short stories, The Eternal Moment, was published in 1928. A Binger Harvest, 1936, is a collection of reprints of reviews and articles. During World War II, he broadcast many essays over the BBC. He has written a pageant play, England's Pleasant Land, a film, Diary for Timothy, two biographies, Goldsworthy Lowe's Dickinson in 1934 and Marianne Thornton in 1956, a libretto for Benjamin Britten's opera, Billy Budd with Eric Rozier, and numerous essays. In 1953, he published The Hill of Devi, an uneven collection of letters and reminiscences of his experiences in India. In 1960, A Passage to India was adopted for the stage by Santhar Rama Rao. After playing in London for a year, the play opened on Broadway on January 31, 1962 and ran for 110 performances. Although Foster was delighted with the adaptation, most of the American critics felt the play did not measure up to the novel. In 1946, Foster moved to King's College in Cambridge to live there as an honorary fellow. Mr. Foster's numerous awards included membership in the Order of Companions of Honour, a recognition bestowed in 1953 by Queen Elizabeth II. Foster died on June 7, 1970. So, that's all for now. If you found this video useful, we would really love it if you could give it a thumbs up. Also, do subscribe to our channel where we offer lots of free material that you can use as part of your studies to get a better understanding of specific areas that you might find challenging. Also, if you need more information, either on a passage to India or more generally for other areas in your course, make sure to visit our website, which is www.firstratetutors.com. There you will find useful revision guides, model answers and tools that you can use to get top marks in your coursework or exams. Thank you for listening.